Hello, and welcome to the new episode of Space Generation Advisory Council's webinar series on health in space. This episode is all about space analogs. My name is Eve Mayer, and my guests today are Dr. Agatha Kolodejcik and Ilaria Merley. What have we learned so far from the planetary mission simulations? What do we still need to learn for successful and healthy space colonies of the future? And how can this knowledge improve our lives here on Earth? So first, we hear from Dr. Agata Kolodejcik. She's a neuroscientist, an astrobiologist, and an innovator. Agata is a co-founder of Analog Astronaut Training Center in Poland, where she's currently working as a director of scientific projects. After obtaining her doctorate from the University of Stockholm, she worked at the European Space Agency in the advanced concept team in the Netherlands. Dr. Kolodejcik has authored numerous educational and scientific publications on chronobiology, space biology, and neurobiology. She was also a co-founder of Space Garden Company, a chair of Lunaris Scientific Council, and a director of advanced concepts at the private space agency, the Balis Marinaris. After Dr. Kolodejcik, we will hear from Ilaria Merley. Ilaria is a science officer and BME at Eskilokis, a student-led human spaceflight analog mission that simulates life on other terrestrial bodies. She's currently studying bachelor's in health science and technology. In 2021, Ilaria participated in human space physiology training course at the European Space Agency, where she presented a roadmap towards making spaceflight more inclusive and accessible for people with physical disabilities. To showcase underrepresented scientists and foster wider cooperation in the space sector, Ilaria coordinates an international team of women to deliver the outreach program Space to Reflect. Now, let's get to our first speaker. Dr. Agata Kaladejcik, do you mind to share your screen, please? Uh, I hope you all see uh, my slides. So, uh, welcome everyone uh, during this uh, nice evening, or maybe for some of you uh, during the day. I see some of my friends here. It is so pleasure to, to be here with you all together and to speak and um, philosophize about uh, health in space, about life sciences during analog missions. So, besides what uh, I was presented, thank you, Eve, for this beautiful presentation of my person. Um, I became uh, quite recently a leader of life science for space laboratory in Space Technology Center at AGH here in Poland. So, um, this allows us to make some alliance with Universe, which is uh, European Space University for students and of course we are going uh, to make analog missions like a standard course uh, for five ECTS points and we will also uh, make it very formal like engineering, master and doctoral thesis that will occur in this analog environment. So first I will tell you what kind of laboratory we have. Yes, this will be very short, but you can already see what kind of laboratory we have, which simulates a spaceship. So we are running isolated missions because most of the time astronauts spend in isolation. Yes. Uh, of course, they are making EVA, they are making beautiful and very explorative uh, field campaigns, but most of the time they spend in confinement in, sp in spaceship. That is why our laboratory is strictly devoted uh, for making research inside the spaceship. Of course, mostly we are focused on the um, gateway, on uh, deep space exploration now and on the moon colonization. So you can see here kind of equipment. Our, our habitat is really, really um, fully equipped with equipment. 
there is very space for humans there. And here already you see our analog astronauts making their works. Okay, so uh, facility is very important. So you need to have laboratory, you need to have some space in order to run analog research. Uh, now I will uh, go back to the presentation. So one more time, the start. Okay, so uh, because we have this infrastructure, we have our habitat, um, we feel like in, uh, you know, in, uh, in this movie, Valerian and the City of Thousand Planets, and we feel like these people who are welcoming, uh, new people coming uh, every time, nearly every week uh, now to Poland and to visit us. Here you see all countries that we already um, had in our habitat. So uh, there are plenty of people coming from all around the world. And I tell you, this is now, um, now I didn't put uh, the actual mission Alula that is ongoing. Uh, we are now uh, nearly finished with uh, Alula mission, but you can see how many missions we already organized. And um, this gives us amazing, you know, experience about how to provide uh, efficient time. This is seven, usually seven day analog mission and how to make students, mostly students, um, very effective in their work so they can publish paper and they can uh, run their master thesis. So first maybe I will start uh, what we understand by analog missions. Uh, well, we are organizing various types of analogs and uh, here you can see uh, mostly like a two, uh, two main divisions between field campaigns, which are missions in places simulating conditions on the moon, Mars, or other celestial bodies. And these include deserts, polar terrains, rocky volcanic regions, or stratosphere and underwater environments. And closed analogs. So uh, these uh, type of uh, missions refer to more or less advanced based and spacecraft simulators. So you need to have some infrastructure, isolated infrastructure, and you need to have your uh, students, your people there. So um, currently we observe a huge increase uh, of interest in analog missions and we are very happy because we see, we observe from our background that students can learn a lot of things, can learn to work in interdisciplinary, um, interdisciplinary and international team. This is very important. So we see that they gain a unique experience in this type of environment beside they train their limits, their body limits, and of course they gain um, new data which are uh, also very important. And here you can see what we do with students. So of course com considering field campaigns, we test uh, different types of technologies, uh, mostly in the stratosphere or in uh, rocky terrain, for example, we create new pressurized spacesuits. Um, we construct now underwater spacesuits. Uh, we construct uh, underwater habitats. So in three years, I believe in five years, we will have very sophisticated network of underwater habitats. And also we are doing some astrophotography, you know, navigation using stars. This is important. We also do some field campaigns in Arctic mission, in Arctic uh, Honsund uh, Polar Station. And so, for example, we are mapping microbiomes now and uh, pollution, or human pollution um, in isolated areas. I mentioned you diving. Uh, we, uh, we really like to dive and to run several simulations in neutral buoyancy. 
Maybe you know, but astronauts, they train more or less eight hours per day underwater in neutral buoyancy. This is very, very useful if you really think about being an astronaut, about uh, testing your limits, about familiarization with uh, counting on technology, on your life support systems. And diving is kind of uh, very nice testing uh, bed. Of course, we are doing also skydiving. We are doing uh, some extreme things, like, for example, uh, beating records in a very, very freezing cold lake. Uh, for example, uh, recently, two weeks ago, uh, EMPOL 11 mission, we beat a record uh, for staying in freezing water. Uh, we also do um, some like external from the habitat um, experiments on uh, heart. Uh, variability on heart rates, on uh, um, electrocardiograms. Uh, we use uh, several mobile devices. Maybe they are not, you know, perfect considering um, the scientific level. But once you get a lot of data in different types of environments, especially extreme environments, here you see our um, one of the missions that they are testing their um, ECG before and after cryotherapy. And we try to see how this kind of short exposure to very cold temperature, minus 120, this was three minutes of exposure, how this affects uh, heart, uh, heart work. So why we are doing this? Because we try to find the right stuff. What you need to have as a training center, you know, we need to uh, to understand what people need actually in this new space era, what we really need as humanity. Uh, it is now quite easy to answer the question. Uh, look, we have uh, war uh, in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine. And this is, I don't want to say inspiring, but it shows that we are not safe on this planet. We need to adjust very soon to live maybe in very extreme environments. Maybe we will suffer from hunger. Maybe there will be other very critical situations, very extreme situations on our planet. So we are st still struggling to find the right stuff. And of course, we don't want to failure. <laughs> So uh, here, when I'm speaking about gravity, uh, I wanted also to tell you that we are trying to uh, develop uh, some research uh, related with health. In Poland, of course, we have the human centrifuge um, in a military institute of aviation in Warsaw. And we are also training there. This is quite expensive training, but you can test yourself. If you want something cheap, very close to our habitat, we have roller coasters. We also can test some Gs. We also can train uh, these uh, gravity forces, how they act on human body. When you see um, and when you watch uh, several movies uh, related to space, you see habitats because, of course, you want to create the proper laboratory to run um, proper scientific research. Mm, well, inspiration is not very, very good because as you see here, uh, for example, on this movie, mm, the habitat is empty. Everything is done by technology. Uh, astronauts have these kind of hands. They don't want to do. They don't know what to do, really. They have nothing to do. They just watch the, what, what is displayed on the computers and nothing. Completely different is in, in our habitats. We want to teach students. We want to teach people to really be independent from technology, kind of. Um, and for example, it is very hard to believe, but most of people, they even cannot pipe it. And we need to, for example, test urine samples. We need to test uh, saliva samples, blood samples. And many people are even scared of blood. So you see, there are several things that are different comparing to what we see in um, in, in uh, movies. Uh, this is again a scene from our habitat. Again, hands are super busy of these people. They are sleeping three hours per day. Can you imagine? They are always stressed because they cannot follow this schedule. They are always behind the line. 
and they don't know why this subjective time perception in the habitat in confinement is so weird. Again, you see here our habitat, again, all hands are busy, even feet are busy in the gym, because of course we try to, uh, to, to uh, simulate the same conditions as on International Space Station, so each of our analog astronauts is training two hours per day. But we are using this data all the time, we are measuring a lot of data, and I will tell you in a moment how many. Uh, again, uh, here is the inspiration from Martian movie. Again, many people, they are uh, amazed by this uh, scenography, by this um, fab, you know, the, the, the story. What we do in our habitat, uh, we try to standardize emergency simulations. So we have remote control, first of all, for, um, of many, many parameters in the habitat. Uh, so the habitat, the infrastructure itself is not that much important. The most important are sensors that you have there and especially remote control. So can you, for example, control the temperature in your habitat? Can you control the humidity in your habitat? Can you control the light uh, spectrum in your habitat? Can you control the power in your habitat? Can you cut off the power? Can you limit it? power, for example, that power consumption per day is this and, not, and this amount of kilowatts, yes? Um, this we do and we can control many, many parameters. So for example, uh, here you see very hard situation where we switched off the life support system and CO2 levels in the habitat rapidly increased, rapidly increased. So this is not simulation, this is real. People have very low pulse oximetry, you know, like a 96, 95 even. So we see in physiology that these uh, simulations are real. And of course, analog astronauts, they must immediately react. And this is again, not a game, not a simulation. They must to uh, use pipes, they must to use filters, uh, ventilators, um, and they must to go back to green light, yes, because we are green when the habitat is green, it means that the levels of CO2 are fine. Also, what we do in the habitat, water, water is limited supply. We have technical water, which is kind of unlimited, unlimited, and we have drinkable water, which is very, very limited. We ask our astronauts, try to clean, to purify, to reabsorb water from their urine, similarly as it is on ISS. But now this is more uh, like, um, you know, scientific approach, more like engineering technology approach. So they are building new filters, they are building um, new technologies, how to make it more efficient and less um, power, um, you know, the, the lower power consu consumption is used. Also, we have experiments like, like fertilization of completely sterile powders of soils. Uh, we have different types of uh, regular simulants. We have standard uh, Martian simulants that you can buy in the USA, but we have also some uh, simulants of uh, lunar dust uh, that was tested for Rosetta mission. We have also some other types of you know, the, the fracture, the physical and chemical um, parameters, they change and we are trying to work with these all types of soils. We create our own soils. We don't need to buy something. We just think what we need and we create it. Uh, here you see uh, one of students, uh, he was uh, developing uh, during one week he managed to develop and to, to uh, test uh, his own design of bioreactors uh, containing algae and how these bioreactors had efficiency in scrubbing of um, CO2. Also, in the habitat, I believe always you need to be aware that many things are not seen using your visual system. 
most of them are in completely different scales and resolutions and you need to use the proper devices. You need to know how to make a color setting. You need to use, to know how to use microscope, you need to know how to use spectrometer, you know, you need to know how to use many other devices like photometers in order to understand what is happening in your base, even you don't see it, because this is very important in your health. You may have very different types of viruses when you are in isolation. People are living in confined space, they are sharing, especially when they are from different continents, you know, they can share completely different bacteria, completely different viruses, and you never know what can happen. Another thing what you never know what can happen is subjective time perception. If you are in complete isolation, that you don't see the light, the sunlight, you don't see when there is a day, you don't see when it's night, then very interesting thing you can observe in activity of humans. What I already told you, they cannot fulfill all tasks in the line. Their clock, their subjective time perception is completely changed. We already um, know that some subjective time perception tests are running on ISS since two, one, uh, sorry, 2017. And of course, we are measuring different times re resolutions from seconds, then minutes, hours. And we are trying to understand how and what are connections in this kind of time illusions. So here you can see just a draft uh, of data. We are going to publish this soon on ISC in Paris. We are going to present this uh, very interesting data. So we compared our people in isolation and you may say, okay, one week isolation is nothing. But if you are organizing like 40 missions and you have all this data from all these people, you start to get kind of statistical power. And we are using all this data um, trying to understand how they relate to uh, conditions during polar night. So some scientists in Nongerbien in Sweden, they, uh, sorry, in Norway, they agreed to contribute in this research. So we compared in parallel uh, several data considering subjective time perception. Of course, we made uh, controls like normal people sitting here, you and me, uh, we can always uh, be controls for this kind of experiments. Then uh, now we are also focused on testing several prototypes of mobile devices. I believe that this is kind of a future, not only for space, but also for our lives here on planet Earth. Still, we don't know how to measure a level of sugar without uh, collecting the blood samples. So making it non-invasive. How to make it? Still, this is a question. And we have thousands of questions like this. And this is all challenging us, challenging you. Analog simulations are fantastic testing uh, platform for such prototypes. Here you see uh, one of such prototypes that we tested. Mm, this uh, shows uh, voice recording, but not a real recording of voice, but just the frequency and amplitude you can see. And we can see uh, that each person who had this uh, device, uh, we see that at some points, uh, they were speaking together. So you can monitor using just uh, voice and amplitude, uh, I mean, frequency and amplitude. You can already measure group dynamics. And using this kind of different types of methods, you can obtain fantastic cross tests to obtain uh, your conclusions proper, even in such a short term missions. So long term perspective, and I, I wish that all people uh, thinking seriously about analog missions, that we will try to share data. In order to share data, we need somehow to standardize data. So what to measure for each mission, what we should measure in order to collect the huge uh, worldwide database that we can gain understanding, gain a very wise knowledge and experience out of this data. So you are not only um, sitting there in one week doing cool stuff, but you also produce very, very important data. And I think this is another very important thing for students. Okay, I'm not only 
doing this for myself. I'm doing this for our scientists, for our people uh, to be able to make our lives in the future better, yes? So here, um, I wanted also to highlight that if you are already inside the habitat, you need to efficiently use the time. And sometimes you need to prepare to the mission. Of course, preparations to the mission um, are important, but first of all, you need to have scientific objective. You need to have technology objective. You need to have like uh, the public outreach objective. And for example, what we standardize, we always create uh, Google Drives collecting this data from each mission. And uh, we try to collect photos, videos, uh, we try to collect a number of experiments, reports, so all database of experiments that are uh, done during analog simulations, or that they can be done, because some experiments were completed, were published, super, but some experiments were failed. Of course, we measure number of manuscripts, so how many analog astronauts managed to publish their work in the habitat, of course, we also look uh, in longer perspective, how many people that are here in our habitat, they started to uh, work in space sector. And of course, we keep fingers crossed for all our people that will become astronauts. Uh, again, uh, considering evaluation of missions, this is very important. You are not going for the mission just to have fun, but it is kind of a mission. It is kind of um, experiment that you need to report, you need to write a proper documentation and you need to get results. So the basic param parameters that we have, for example, here you have a comparison of several missions from MPL1 to MPL5, and you see um, different variables that we are measuring. So of course, very standard, uh, data like days of the mission, number of astronauts, average age of the crew, then diet type, uh, then uh, what was the uh, water used during whole week of the mission by all the crew. You see some crew, they used 61 uh, liters, but some used 49, yes, uh, and some 109. So you can see al already these variations, the standard deviations between one mission and another and you can gain super nice population data. Not only data from superheroes, but data from normal people. Again, urine, urination. This is very important if you want to create life support system in the future, yes? You see how, what, what are real numbers? This is not uh, any estimation, anything, you know, made from one, two people, but this is from each mission to another, we obtain this data. And then we have some motivation parameters related with sports. So how uh, many kilometers people ran. And you see that some uh, missions, they have very low uh, motivation, kind of. It is 412 kilometers per week they ran. But others, they ran 643 kilometers. Yes. So you see that there are many, many different, very interesting parameters. We also measure sleep quality. We also measure um, bioimpedance. Here I didn't show you. Uh, and of course, we are evaluating emergency simulations. So how fast crew reacts, how they communicate with us. Uh, as I told you before, very important is uh, what you put inside your base, what kind of sensors you use. Otherwise, you will not be able to measure uh, correctly all parameters to collect this uh, beautiful data that we are uh, waiting for. And now we are building another habitat, which will be like a copy paste uh, of the habitat in Poland that we have now, Analog Astronaut Training Center. But this will be much bigger habitat. So now we want to compare 57 square meters to 270 square meters. We want to compare all physiological parameters, how they will react. And we are very open for all of you who want to compare your missions to our missions. We, we would really love to collaborate. collaborate. And with Asclepios team, we already initiated some collaboration, so I believe uh, that there will be very, very interesting study coming out. 
Uh, also here, I already told you that we are working on um, some very, very small habitats. We are space use, as you know, so also we try to um, to insert there as many sensors as possible, um, much more than they are usually used during EVAs by astronauts. Everything to obtain as much data as possible from analogs, because we can do this, because we are on Earth. We don't need to struggle with thousands of problems and with fin finances. And with that, I would like to leave you. Uh, of course, I'm very open for questions. Again, thank you very much for, for being here and for invitation. Um, also in Paris, uh, in September, we will present the book written by our analog astronauts. Uh, they are telling stories uh, worth to share with you. And I believe that this book uh, will be very interesting to read, um, like uh, even before sleep. We are also trying to develop space songbook because we see that astronauts sometimes they like to relax and to sing some space songs. And of course, um, yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. And now we will be switching to Switzerland. Um, hi, Ilaria. So I will, in the next couple of minutes, I will present you the Asclepios Space Analog Mission. And thank you for the previous talk. It was really inspiring to hear from another mission. So what is special about Asclepios is that it is student led. So that means it's a mission for students and also by students. Let's have a look what that means. So what an analog mission is, you have already heard in great detail in the talk before, it's basically activities that are undertaken on Earth to simulate aspects of human space flight on other celestial bodies. We do it to test space related research, to test countermeasures to make human space flight more comfortable, but also because it's less risky and less expensive than actually going to space. And uh, with a background in medicine or life science, you might wonder why participate in an analog mission when there is microgravity is missing, the radiation is kind of missing. Um, but there are actually many stressors in space flight um, that can be modeled in analog missions, such as the air quality, lighting situations, temperature, ambient noise, but also the light and dark cycles, as we have just heard. We can also study the effects of isolation, confinement and monotony, um, as well as different psychological issues like uh, gender issues, cultural effects, because the crews are often very international, personality conflicts, but also leadership issues. And there are much more. This list is really, um, really long. So what is our purpose at Asclepios? We want to design analog missions that are made by students for students. So the whole organizing team, as well as the astronauts, are all students. Our main goals are to educate and to train the next generation of space leaders to be a plat platform for innovative space, up space projects and research, and also to be sustainable at what we do. Asclepios 2 is the mission that will launch very soon in about 60 days from today, and we will simulate a habitat on the lunar south pole. There we will focus on res in situ resource utilization and especially on the extraction of water in order to be sustainable on the moon. On the right, you can see our mission patch for Asclepius 2. For the location of our simulation this year, we have chosen a region in the Alps, in the Sasso San Gotardo, and we selected this location according to three main criteria, so isolation, landscape, and design possibilities. This is one of the, of the tubes that will be in the habitat. We try to simulate something that could be <laughs> looking moonish, moon-like-ish. And this is the entrance to the habitat. And this is the scenery outside of the habitat. We chose a rocky terrain um, to make it look at least a bit lunar. If we would have simulated a station on Mars, of course, we would have gone to the desert. The Asclepius 2 mission will happen in July from the 14th to the 27th of July. So stay tuned for the mission. We will cover it on social media for sure. So how are we organized? This is a picture of our team from last year. Of course, not everyone is on there because our team is really international. We are based in Switzerland, but most of our team are actually not living in Switzerland. On this chart, you can see our team in numbers and you can see their various nationalities. So from 
uh, Germany, Austria and Switzerland, up to Portugal, Spain, UK, Africa, South America, Italy, Russians, the Balkans, France, South Korea and the US. And we're always expanding our teams and new nationalities are always joining. We are structured in different teams. We have the management team that mainly coordinates the project and takes care of financial aspects. We have the astronaut team that selects the crew, trains the crew, and also takes care of the astronauts' health, sports, and nutrition. We have the science team that selects scientific projects from a research group from all over the world. They coordinate these projects and take care of data transfer and ethics in the mission. The design team is mainly responsible to make the mission as realistic as possible. So the design team um, takes care of the design of the base, but also the mission control center and the communications infrastructure. Last but not least, we have a communications team that takes care of outreach events and collaborating with media. Since we're all just students or just, <laughs> We are um, relying on some outside contributors, such as sponsors that donate um, their services, either in cash, or in cash or in kind donations. We have partners that collaborate with us um, or provide us with services or trainings. And we also have really awesome mentors that give us some feedback on our work and tell us if we're on the right track, if our mission is being realistic. But in the end, all decisions and all the planning is done by us students. Here's the selection of our mentors. We have the one and only Swiss astronaut Claude Nicolier. We have Romain Charles. He's been in Mars 500, so the longest analog mission that was ever uh, undertaken. We have an explorer, Alvon Michon. He takes the astronauts on extreme environment trainings and much more. For the mission design, this is our rough flight plan for this year. We will set up the base on July 9th until July 14th. The astronauts will arrive in quarantine in that time. Then from the 13th to the 27th, the mission will happen. We will set up the base and the base will be connected to the mission control center 24 seven. And after two weeks, we will end the simulations and the astronauts will land back on Earth. MCC, that stands for Mission Control Center. And this is the ground-based facility that manages spaceflight operations from launch until landing. And the special thing about Asclepios is that we are actually also simulating the MCC. So in the MCC, we're also all, we're also all students. And the objective is to have it staffed 24 seven to take care of the health and safety of the astronauts, to coordinate the flight plan and to handle all data that comes out of the base or into the base. And the picture on the right is from the MCC from last year. The analog base is where the astronauts are living and for every iteration of the Asclepios project, we are searching and designing a new base. So the base is just really there for hosting the astronauts, but also to enable scientific experiments and the performance of EVAs, so extravehicular activities. The science team has a call for project every year. Um, the next one will be in the fall where we collect experiments, prototypes, technologies, um, ideas um, for any kind of scientific experiment that can be performed and tested during the Asclepios missions. This year, we have about 20 experiments that came out of this call and the target audiences for these call for projects are really everyone from individuals to, so, to groups, to companies, students, universities, startups, and we have uh, various fields that can apply. So the astronaut team, um, to, to join the astronaut team, you need to go through a lengthy selection that is inspired by ESA. So in the first part, you just have the CV um, reading motivation letter screening. Phase B is a personality test and English level test. Phase C is a technical and cognitive test. And phase D is on site in Switzerland. And it consists of interviews, physical tests and group dynamic analyses. This is all with the ultimate goal to select a crew that works well together. Once someone has been selected, they can participate in training. So here the astronauts went ice diving on a glacier lake on over 2000 meters above sea level. So that was really exciting. During these extreme environment trainings, they prepare for the space mission or analog space mission. They learn to listen, to help each other, and to also embrace discomfort. I will skip the video due to time reasons. 
So what you might be most interested in are the opportunities that you have um, with us, with Asclepios. So first of all, you can actually become a member if you're a student. We are looking for motivated, reliable and enthusiastic students to join our team. We will actually open the recruitment very, very soon on our website, so it could be this week still. And all levels of studies are welcome to join us. So you can be in high school, but you can also be a PhD student and your major doesn't matter. So you can be a medical student, you can be an arts or business student. You're welcome to apply if there's a position that suits you. We also accept students of all nationalities. So that's also quite uh, special because often space programs uh, restrict um, from which nationality you can come from and participate, but we're really open for anyone. The main language is English and you can apply on esclepios.ch slash become a member. If you are not a student anymore, but you would still like to work with us, you can do your research with us. So as I explained, you can submit your research to the call for projects and that will open in September probably. And very exciting, you can also become an analog astronaut and the recruitment for the fourth mission will open towards the end of this year. So on the right, there's some pictures of us um, in trainings. We often have meetings online because the team is so international. And yeah, I think that's it. Here are our sponsors and our social media. Um, please connect with us. We look forward to exchanging um, conversations, ideas with you. And thank you so much for listening. If there are any citizenship requirements for students to participate in these missions that you're holding and uh, um, do you need to be from a certain background or study field um, to participate? Thank you for this question and for interest. Uh, I didn't know that this is like an advertising uh, presentation because I would say everything in my presentation. But of course, uh, everyone is uh, more than welcome, especially if you have some idea. Um, I see also some questions about fellowship. There is also a possibility that if you come here, for example, to improve our habitat, uh, for example, to say that hmm, I want to make uh, something what you will ask me to do, and then you are here for free, uh, of course, unless you can do this. <laughs> so we, we are sharing emails, okay, what you can do, you know, and uh, then uh, we try to obtain some deal. Uh, but of course, uh, most of people are welcome. We don't have, this is important, we don't have any age restrictions. So, of course, we need to have parent agreement for people who are younger than 18 years old. And uh, we welcome people who are not students. We welcome scientists. We welcome uh, very interesting people. For example, uh, we hosted, uh, we honored to host uh, here a director of artificial in intelligence of uh, European Space Agency. And for us, this was a great exper experience. Even students were loving this guy, yes, analog astronaut, who was his commander. This was great. This was awesome to have in analog mission, somebody like this person. So we are welcoming all people because our mission is to collect data from all population. We are going to live on the moon. So we need to know data, not from superheroes, but from each of you. How do you handle medical emergency in the analog mission? Do you have any experience of that? Fortunately, we never had a serious problem uh, during our missions, but in case of some problem, we have uh, two nurses on site that immediately can react. And we have medical doctor on site in the village where the habitat is located. We have ambulance 20 minutes from our habitat of right, of course. And we have a hospital 40 minutes from our habitat. So this is like the, the basic parameters. Uh, of course, remotely, we have uh, medical doctors. For example, we have uh, Mary McKay, uh, who's working, uh, kindly working voluntary for us. Uh, he's also collaborating with uh, European Astronaut Center at ESA. So uh, he is uh, running some research in uh, our, uh, in our, uh, yeah, during, in our habitat, sorry. Mm. So, yes, so we have, of course, remote doctors uh, who are measuring, observing the parameters, but the, the real emergency we never had, and we are prepared for this also. Yes. How much time uh, can take one of those analog missions? 
is it like a few months is it a week because obviously people want to plan their the lives around it for us uh, the recruitment of the S analog astronaut crew happens around one year before the actual mission and um, we work together with the selected astronauts in order to prepare the mission and to train them for the mission and so that they are really um, all mission specialists on what will happen during the mission. So during the week, it might range from actually nothing to do up until a full week of trainings. Um, so the commitment is, it varies a bit throughout the year, um, but we, we really enjoy that part of bonding and um, preparing the mission with our astronauts together. Then the actual mission last year, it was around 10 days. This year, it will be two weeks. Uh, so for us, it is, much, uh, I mean, it is less exclusive because we recruit all the time and we run all our missions like one week missions from April till October constantly. So one mission is, uh, you know, uh, on board and then ne next mission is already preparing and the next and next and next. So um, you need to sign up for the list uh, that is on our um, website. I will. Uh, paste it here in the trap uh, and once you are there uh, I will send you an email that for example we have one free place for next week or for next month or maybe you can jump into some free time slots because we we always have somebody cannot simply get visa or, or something happens so Basically, it is like even in two weeks, in one month, you can jump into the mission. So could you speak a little bit more about um, the ethical permits uh, for the analog missions? Do you have any barriers in getting those ethical approvals? Well, we are scientists, so this is bonus for us. And we are writing bioethical committee applications. And we have, um, of course, the, the issue is that each separate experiment requires separated uh, bioethical agreement. So you need to basically write uh, hundreds of papers, you know, and you need to wait and uh, gain uh, approval. Very often they said, ah, this is not ethical. You need to correct this. You need to inform uh, analog astronauts with this, with that. And of course we are correcting this. So we wait one more month because these uh, meetings, uh, bioethical committee meetings occur twice per month. But yes, we do this and we know how to do this. Uh, we know limitations. Now in Poland, unfortunately, um, we need to have medical doctor if we are going to do any invasive uh, biomedical research. So for example, collection of blood is already invasive, yes? So for this, I cannot apply, even I am biologist, only medical doctor can apply. This is ridiculous law in Poland. Now it appears because it appeared that scientists uh, they overused this kind of uh, sampling oh, i don't know I how it is in yeah. switzerland <laughs> switzerland is really strict when it comes to ethical regulations um, i understand it because we want to keep our participants safe but um, same for you it's also a lot of work for us actually if you're in the science team taking care of the ethical approvals um, submitting the research for review, um, taking care of data protection is actually a really big chunk of work. <laughs> so yes, that's definitely an important consideration in the analog missions. Yeah. And one last question before we have to finish up the session is whether one can study effect of radiation and gravity on cellular level um, at one of those space analog missions. Hilarious. <laughs> so for us, not no, not so far. We focus our simulation, our ground-based studies on all the other aspects, but not radiation and microgravity. Um, I guess if a research project would apply to to have like something like a bioreactor or some kind of radiation simulation on, on cells just within the habitat, that might be possible, but we're not exposing our astronauts to radiation and microgravity. Um, of course, we'd love to offer our astronauts a flight in zero G, for instance, but uh, this is uh, something for the future, maybe. Um, 
So we are specialized more in uh, remote uh, radiation uh, projects, like for example, observing uh, spaceweather.com. Uh, also, I really, um, space weather, I, I'm writing now, spaceweather.com, where you can trace all uh, solar flares, solar activity. I have it on my mobile phone and I synchronize uh, emergency simulations in the habitat and power blackouts with this uh, information directly coming from the sun and solar flares and magnetic storms. So uh, this we have, and this is real, yes? So of course, this is not harmful for our analog astronauts, but they are more and more, you know, educated about that we are not alone in space and we are not really safe. That, you know, before some years ago, there were magnetic storms that were really could switch off light in whole city. And we need to be aware that our sun became active now and they can observe how this affects their physiological parameters. This is one number one, very interesting topic that they are searching. And another thing, what we are doing with radiation, um, and there is another application to monitor secondary particles, uh, Neutrina. Uh, this is a Credo project. Uh, you can read about it. And again, download application project. This is for free, everything. Um, Credo project where you can see, uh, when you can use again your smartphones and detect these uh, secondary particles. So this we are doing in the habitat. This is, as I told you, just uh, you, you use your mobile phone. With uh, microgravity studies, yes, we do uh, We do um, microgravity studies using random positioning machines and clinostats. We are producing these machines. Uh, they are not certified because it costs a lot of money. So we prefer to produce 10 machines instead of one certified <laughs> because many people can do different types of, you know, and, uh, radiative speed. Um, and they can use uh, lunar speed, lunar gravity, because these random machines, of course, they, uh, they, they have software that randomly selects, of course, the vector of gravity. And, and on the scale of, you know, cells, especially plant cells, uh, these plants are very slow reactive uh, organisms. So the, the seeds, the otoliths, they are falling down in the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is dense. So once you rotate, um, these plant cells, these uh, stomach, this uh, you know, uh, the sensors, gravity sensors, they touch different uh, different sides of the cellular uh, membrane, and then plant has completely no idea where it's up and down. So Thank you very much. That that was, uh, I believe, our last question for for today. We're we're on top of the hour. If you have any further questions feel free to reach out to our speakers on LinkedIn. So once again, thank you very much for you all and see you next time.